we can start. Um, and this is pretty much an open meeting. It's really for people to um, present whatever they want to present, whether it's a question, theoretical question, hopefully a clinical question rather than theoretical, um, whatever, whatever it is for people. Um, you know, and I'm, I'm kind of here to some extent to answer if I can, but so is everybody else. So this is not a, this is not about, this is not about me. I'm just facilitating this. Um, so let's see what's going on. Um, so welcome. Thank you. Anybody, Mel, would you like to introduce yourself perhaps? Uh, sure. Um, my name is Mel. Um, I'm an acupuncturist practicing in Rhode Island. Um, I originally trained in the UK and started my practice there. Um, I also did an additional degree in nutrition and functional medicine. And so um, an increasing amount of my practice has moved in that direction. And um, I was attracted to this meeting, partly because I'm familiar with your work and, and the people that you study with. And I feel that as I'm doing more and more biochemistry, which I enjoy, I'm losing a feel of the bigger patterns. Mm. So I'm losing that, that sense of the seeing how the things fit together. And so I thought it would be nice to maybe even just listen in, in the meeting as people discuss cases using you know, more sort of traditional Chinese medicine or Japanese or that sort of thing, just to remind myself that that's usually the most helpful place to start for most patients. Mm. Interesting. Thank you. And Mary Jo? Um, so I'm practicing in Ireland, uh, in the west of Ireland, in uh, County Mayo. And I have a small practice from my home, basically. I just have a room in my house. And I started practicing 2014, maybe early 2015. Uh, so I was a, a latecomer to acupuncture. <laughs> And um, I suppose my, I feel my biggest problem is that I don't have built up enough clientele yet to kind of get a real feel for, you know, the pract practice in general, you know, that my experience is probably a little bit limited as of yet. <laughs> um, so I was just attracted to um, Kiko Masamoto's style. Uh, following um, um, a workshop in Dublin by Andy Harrop um, in 2016 or 17. Um, so I liked the idea that it's kind of, uh, you know, using more Western terminology and people can kind of understand it better and so can I. <laughs> and um, so basically, I suppose I haven't really uh, practiced in the traditional Chinese style, really, at all. Mm -hmm. uh, or maybe for, for a short while. <clears throat> so I'm trying to come to grips with, um, <laughs> with this, this style. Uh, and I just I have found that I've actually got more results as well, uh, clinically, from, <clears throat> from using this style. So any questions? Uh, otherwise, I have some for you, Mel. <laughs> um, no, because it is a very um, common thing for people now to do this, the functional medicine thing. And um, because I think many people get disappointed with, um, well, acupuncture is supposed to be me me a medicine on its own, and somehow we're not getting what we want out of it. Um, so we're branching out to whatever we can. So, uh, and functional medicine is definitely a big thing, you know, currently. Um, it reminds me of a PT who last week said, oh, yeah, you know, now it's dry needling. And 10 years ago, it was the Gersten method. Every, we're always looking for the silver bullet. And maybe the silver bullet is biochemical. And maybe, you know, I don't know, you know, there's different ways to approach. But it's kind of interesting. And then you say, I'm interested in um, coming back to... Um, this other um, method um, and seeing, you know, that it's actually, you know, it gives you me a larger picture. So I'm kind of curious to, to hear more from you sure. about that. Sure. Um, so 
the the reason why I trained in functional medicine wasn't so much because I was disappointed in the results from acupuncture, but I just didn't feel like I had an internal medicine to go with ac acupuncture. So a lot of people are acupuncturists and herbalists. Um, and I think I was attracted to it because it's what helped me, uh, the combination of uh, acupuncture and um, and nutrition and, and um, lab testing. Um, and I really have always felt that I was very um, grateful that I'd studied Chinese medicine first before studying biochemistry, because that makes it very easy. Everything is yin and yang when you're studying biochemical pathways. And I felt um, quite bad for uh, doctors going to medical school because they're learning all of this as if it was discrete information, which is really enough to make you insane. Um, so my feeling has always been that, um, you know, there are things in the body that follow the pattern of, you know, a, a single chemical causing a big change, but those are the exceptions rather than the rules. But that is really the model on which uh, conventional medicine is based. But if we can take our more macroscopic lens, which is both seeing the patient as a whole and seeing the patient in the context of their environment, um, and then where is necessary zooming in, or where is, sorry, where is helpful zooming in, um, then it's a very elegant way to treat and very, and I, I really enjoy it. Um, but I think because the patients I see come in with such a deep understanding of biochemistry and I get very quickly get sucked into these, um, these discussions and a lot of my mentorship in the last couple of years has been on the functional medicine side. I feel like I'm losing touch of that kind of seeing, you know, that you, that you get that very, um, you, know, you might say right brain or, or um, both hemispheres working well together where you kind of get the pattern before talking about blood sugar or H pylori or these things. And so, um, so yeah, so it's, it's not so much that I became disillusioned with acupuncture, then fell into biochemistry and now I'm coming back. It's more trying to keep my, uh, my way of seeing balanced and helpful and the training I've done has been really interesting and now I want to make sure I'm immersing myself well or you know having these discussions where we look at the patterns again because for most patients the patterns are going to be more relevant than individual molecules thank you okay anyone else camille i unmuted you you may not you probably noticed okay um Anyone with any questions or comments or anything at all? Can I ask, Abby? Um, yes. Sometimes I, uh, just on the abdominal diagnosis, mm -hmm. um, sometimes I find um, when um, people have the right side stomach 26, 27 reflex, Mm -hmm. I just find it a bit confusing to kind of kind of zone in on on the problem because there are, there are so many variables there um you know kidney lung immune um have you any let's say tips or um insight into how like for instance if somebody had let's say adrenal would you automatically think that maybe that right side stomach 26 27 reflex might be related to the adrenal okay. uh no <laughs> uh the, i mean the, the simple answer is because they are different there okay so right stomach 26 27 can represent a number of things i believe there's five of them the first one is immunity because it's right over the appendix um so it's basically an immune organ it can represent the lungs it can represent digestion because it's over the appendix, in other words, the ileocecal valve. And it can represent a pelvic shift, which basically means that from the front, you're not going to be able to resolve it. The way you know whether it's a pelvic shift or not is you press on the pel um, sacral iliac ligaments while they're lying face up, so you have to get your hand under, and see, and it can be either side. See if right stomach 26 gets better. Then you kind of go, okay, that's a pelvic shift and you let go on the front on, with it. And the last one is um, what we call kidney, but this is a different kidney than adrenal. This is, you know, the kidney's ability for regeneration. It's the transition from the wood element to the water element. 
Okay, I'm sorry, the other way around, from the water element to the wood element. In other words, from death to, or from winter to spring. Okay, so because, um, so basically what you're looking at, uh, and it's a very common pattern now, okay, the right stomach 26, 27. If you go back 20 years, there were a lot less people with stomach 26, 27. Um, we, you know, showing on the body, and we always talk, oh, left stomach 26, 27 was the big thing, okay, so, and to this day, there are people, and we often teach left stomach 26, 27 as the first finding um, to look at simply because it's convenient, but not because it shows so much on patients, in my experience, but 20 years ago, left side 26, 27 showed all the time, whereas right side stomach 26, 27 was kind of rare and very particular. What happens now, because this is just my opinion, we have gone through various shifts in our um, social cultural uh, understanding of life. And, you know, and that includes, you know, you, could, you know, it, it's not just the Trump age. This is way before the Trump age. This started already, I would say in 2001. That, and I think it has a lot to do. It has basis with we're a culture that feels desperate in some ways. We feel um, we're unable to control our destiny. We've known that, um, you know, things are not going well for 40, 50 years. I mean, they've been talking about recycling when I was a child, okay? I was a child 45, 50 years ago, okay? So it was a long time ago. And yet, here we are, we're talking about catastrophic consequences of our actions or lack of actions. Um, over the years. So over time, we get to a point, and we're also in a culture that's very computerized, which means if you've ever tried calling one of those call centers, and they can be, you know, right next door to you, or they can be in a country that with a person you know does not really speak your language, but they have a script. But what, whatever it is, you, you're encountering more and more of this phenomenon with, where people are unable to do anything because the computer can't let, will not let them do it. Everything is scripted for them in the workplace. So what you, can't, what you think you should be able to accomplish yourself, your sense of personal responsibility is eroded. So therefore, we have a culture of not being able to spring forward anymore. Okay? It, it's just we kind of gave up. And I think that's why stomach 26, 27 on the right side is showing so much more nowadays because it's not that people have more lung problems or even the specific digestive problems that will show there um, because these are not digestive problems that have to do with the upper GI but more um, lower GI kind of problems. It's really because culturally we are a culture of weird fear. There is fear and there's the ignoring the fear constantly. And that's what's showing. So I would say start, unless there's a specific history of I had my appendix removed, I have lung problems or immune problems, unless you know specifically it's there, I would start with, say, kidney seven. Now, right stomach 26, 27 is more likely to correlate with pressure pain on kidney two, especially on the right side, which, by the way, is more common. Pressure pain on the right side on kidney two is more common than on the left or on both. Okay, especially for women. But I would start with assuming it's kidney nowadays, as opposed to going through, is it lungs? Is it immune? Is it um, um, appendix? Is it digestion? You're kind of more likely to catch it by saying this is likely to be kidney regeneration. And the point that's most likely to do it is kidney seven. And as you may or may not know, I, I talk a lot about kidney seven as, you know, it, it, it is related to being able to push up because at kidney seven, there's a sort of a downward feeling, like things are lumping down there and you really want to needle it up. You want to give it an upward movement. So that's related to the chwai, the ability to push down, to move up. Okay. So, so that's the dogmat dogmatic answer. Assume it's kidney un unless proven wrong. However, uh, I would also say that, okay, so you have five possibilities, okay? Lung, immune, digestion, pelvic shift, and kidney. 
a kidney's ability to regenerate, which will be important for people who are dealing with fertility issues, for example, but not, you know, um, so they have a particular interest in that. Um, of the five, so what I would train myself to do is check all five for the sake of it. Even if kidney seven, so the way I work is a little bit different than other people. Say I found that kidney seven worked, I'm still going to check lung five or lung eight. I'm still going to check immune. I'm still going to check to see if there's a pelvic, because there can be a pelvic shift also. There can be a digestive issue also. It may be primarily kidney. So if I just go, ah, kidney seven resolved everything, and by the way, it resolved the SCM, and it resolved REN17, and it resolved whatever else there is, Fabulous. I know that kidney seven is like the important point for this person, but what I don't know is what else is contributing and might be lying underneath. So it, it behooves me to check everything else that's a possibility and everything else in the medical history. So to train oneself to not ignore all the possibilities and check them out and then decide and pri then prioritize. So I think sometimes we jump the gun. Okay, and it's especially, uh, I don't want to sound like I'm criticizing, but I guess I am in some ways. This okay. style is taught often as here is a map of the abdomen, this is what it means, and here are the points that resolve it. Okay, the problem with doing that, that certainly works, and certainly if, you, if you're seeing more than 10, 15 patients a day, actually more than 10, I would say, you're not going to have a lot of option. You're going to have to use protocols. You're not going to have a lot of leeway for playing, okay? Even if it only takes five minutes to play, it's still a lot of time when you're seeing a lot of patients. But in my opinion, you should start with a medical history. And even before you, you palpate the abdomen, the abdomen is a confirmation or a non-confirmation of what you're thinking. So you're going, mm, this person has thyroid issues, this person has um, heart disease in the family. I wonder if that's the cause of the thing. And then you're trying to see if that's true. Okay, so that you actually get more from the medical history. We're not supposed to be magicians. We're not supposed to read the body from nowhere. You know, often patients come, you know, the ones who give you them, um, their hand, and they say, oh, can you read my pulse and tell me what's going on? It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's, you know, and sometimes we can do something interesting with that. And sometimes it's a total waste of time. And ultimately, it's always a waste of time to do that without knowing what the patient is there for. Because the pulse or the abdomen or anything you're using is just part of the picture. So it's worth finding out what else there is out there. Um, so that's why I checked, let's say kidney seven did work, I would still check, is it lungs? Is it immune? Is it digestion? Now, if they have no history of any of these three, maybe it's not even worth checking. But what I do is I check all the options before I needle anything ever. Okay. And then I needle. Okay. As opposed to, oh, this point resolved this reflex. Let me needle it. Does that make sense? Yes, yes. And for digestion, Abby, would you mainly spleen points, would it be? Uh, generally speaking, for uh, right side, stomach 26, 27, it tends to be spleen 9. It can be spleen 3 as well. It could be stomach 41 uh, or stomach G. I'm a little less um, enthusiastic, let's say, about stomach G points you know, the bumps between stomach 40 and stomach 41. I'm bigger on stomach 41, generally speaking. I find it, it's, it, it, it does more, even though it's supposed to. Historically, stomach 41 was the original stomach G, and the stomach G points were added because they're supposed to be more powerful. They're good if you have the specific pulse for it, the pulse that just jumps up that doesn't have a forward movement. That's a, considered a pulse that doesn't have stomach chi. But um, if you don't have that, generally speaking, I find that stomach 41 does, does do a better job. So any of those are likely. Um, and then the problem with digestion is because so many digestive issues involve the autonomic nervous system, you may find that you, even though... Well, actually, I'm, I was going to make a statement that I don't know if the vagus nerve actually goes to the intestines, and I might be wrong. So I'm, I'm going to say I don't know. It doesn't have as direct a relationship with the intestines, to my knowledge, as it does with the stomach. Okay, So um, 
but still sometimes releasing the SCM is is the strategy to go to go and the other confusing part is okay so then you say okay it's not digestion it's immune and you do the immune point convince you doing an immune treatment but then you've got a little bit of a problem because the immune point is basically we you know we say it's not on the large intestine channel it's too close to the bone but it's still basically in the large intestine zone so you know can you really you know in other words what I'm encouraging people to do is be very flexible in their diagnostic skills, not get attached to, it was this. Maybe it was this, maybe it's that. The only thing you're attaching yourself to is this point works for this patient. Hmm, that's cute. That's interesting. And I arrived at it from a particular diagnosis that can still be wrong, but the only thing that matters is, is the patient getting better. So a little more flexibility around the ideas if, as much as we can. Does that answer it? Yes, Josephie, thank you. And it is a very large, I mean, it's probably the most prominent finding we have nowadays is this right stomach 26, 27. And that's, again, you know, you, you don't need to investigate the medical history. You know they have it. I mean, they have this sort of, I mean, a few, of course, not everyone has it, but since it's kind of in the air, it's part of the culture, it's kind of part of the medical history without them knowing it this sort of like, there's fear with apathy and lack of being able to move forward. It's part of today's culture, you know, and there are always going to be Pollyannas out there who are not like that, you know, optimistic <laughs> and everything is cool and everything is wonderful. But as a whole, we do tend to be um, much more so than say, um, you know, say the generation, you know, I mean, look at the generation after World War II, where you would have expected a lot more despair, you know, with nuclear arms, you know, the thing is people felt that this was a short-term disaster for, for humankind. And with good, um, whether good politics or good whatever, we can get over, we can manage this. We don't really have that sense anymore as a, as a whole. You know, there's a certain lack of that. And I think that my belief is that this is why Stomach 26, 27 shows so much more. Thank you. Anyone else? Do, do you use the eight extraordinary vessels pretty much a lot in your practice? Not a lot. No, okay. Uh, I do. So I have two different uses for eight, eight extra vessels. Um, so one is a psychological issues. Uh, in a psychological issue, that's, this comes from Jeffrey, uh, a high influence of, from Jeffrey Yuen. Um, when someone has had uh, a psychological issue that's very clearly rooted e either in ancestry, in their constitution, or very, very, very early childhood. And conceivably, because the eight extraordinary vessels are supposed to have a cycle of, of the seven and eight, which, by the way, is doubtful whether it's seven or eight, so I'm going to call it decade cycles. No, because, because at age 49, you're supposed to die. At age 56, you're supposed to die. By the way, it's supposed to be the opposite. Women's supposed to live longer. <laughs> so, of course, the answer is, Oh, so when one is talking about your physical life and then you have a spiritual life, blah, 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 you're no longer worried about reproduction and looking pretty and making a career. Yes, you know, you can make those excuses, but I, I would say that seven and eight year cycles are not exactly um, accurate necessarily for today's world at least. So what I would say is that when you're seeing somebody with patterns that seem to conceivably be related to, um, to say somewhere between seven and 10 years, let's say. Um, it's, it's a possibility or if something comes from very early childhood or um, prenatal or from ancestors, uh, and it's definitely, they feel like it's part of the constitution, then I'm looking at eight extraordinary vessels. And then I'm not looking at opening, opening and uh, paired points which are kind of a quote-unquote later invention, whatever later means. <laughs> you know, it's still, it's about 700 years old, so to call it later is a little bit weird. Um, but the way Jeffrey looks at it is actually needling the channel itself. 
So we'll include the opening point, but actually needling the channel. So you have, um, now this is where I don't do well with some of the yang channels. Uh, I do better with the yin channels because I have certain blockages um, in my ability to understand. So for um, the chung would be where you have uh, an issue uh, with who you are in life. Okay, what Jeffrey calls the blueprint. So it can be simple things like, well, I don't like my nose. Well, if you have a nose job, everything is cool. No, no big deal. Um, but if you keep saying to you, I don't like my nose, I don't like my nose, <laughs> you know, I'm trying to erase my nose, and this can, you know, you can throw this into other issues. So your blueprint is who you are in terms of you were born into this world with a certain gender, a certain race, it's a certain time period. I know people who would love to live in the Victorian era. They don't fit in this time. They do not fit in the blueprint that their ancestors gave them to experiment with. So those are Chung issues, and you can look into, so you can needle the Chung, and you know, you don't have to needle every point. You, you, I do spleen four, kidney 11, kidney 16, um, I think it's kidney 21 just before the ribs, and 27, okay? And I needle pericardium six not so much as a, um, as a paired point to spleen four as much as to open the chest because you are going to have issues around what comes up. Um, the renmai has to do with attachment to mother. You know, renmai is how we touch mother all the time as, as children. So if mother has been over controlling or has given us too much freedom without being there for us. Camille, you had a comment? No, I don't really have a comment. Um, um, I have different takes on it but i this is your show so I no 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 i'd like to hear your 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 view so give me a two seconds or two minutes um well do you want to finish first and then i'll go or that's what i was thinking yes okay. i'd be happy to to Great. fill in some things wonderful okay cool um so the ren would be um one's attachment to mother, and if mother has been there uh, overly bearing, you might develop uh, renmai issues, or if mother has abandoned you a little bit, you may have, you're, you're always seeking mother, so you're seeking quote-unquote dampness, you're seeking yin. Uh, so that can, you know, be asthmatic or digestive issues and things like that, you know, typical renmai um, syndromes that we see. Um, the do, which I don't use much, is, is meant to be your ability to actually separate from mother to move forward, you know, to activate your spine, to activate the do and move as a separate person. And then the chow vessels, um, the way vessels are supposed to be how you see yourself or you see yourself against the world, vis-a-vis -vis the world, um, in terms of these cycles, things change. And the chow vessels are how you, um, what roles you play. You know, am I happy with the role I'm playing in life? And of course, we play many roles at any different point. You know, for example, I'm, I'm, I'm playing the role of this is my show right now, as Camille says it. But, <laughs> but when, when Camille speaks, I play the role of, oh, this is kind of cool and interesting. Or, well, I don't agree or whatever I choose to do there. Um, so there are different roles that we constantly play. And do we feel comfortable with these roles? And what does it mean for our psychological happiness? So, um, so those are places where I would go for eight extraordinary channels. And the other place I use them is with IP cords, iron pumping cords, um, you know, kind of like, and I don't use the Monica style. I actually use the Kawhi style. Um, and I, and the reason I do that is because that's a needleless treatment. You tape the iron pumping cords and you, you uh, spark the red needle that's on the left. And they also cross, so they don't have a chance as much. It has happened to me occasionally, but generally speaking, the Monica style has a much higher chance of the patient not feeling good with it. The Kawai style that crosses uh, tends to avoid that problem. Um, and I use that as a preparation, and then I can put, I can put more needles in. Um, so if they clearly have lower jowl problems, um, then... Um, what we call chow chow is as appropriate and if they have upper jowl issues then um the um, the way way uh treatment is appropriate 
Um, so, and I do do that. It's to some extent, but not, it's not my, you know, there are people for whom this is their bread and butter. Uh, and this is definitely not. So, Camille, would you like to chime in and add? Some well, well, I, I, my understanding of the Chong is, well, he, first of all, he thinks, he thinks of the, the, um, the Chong, the Ren, and the Du as as sort of the the primordial trilogy that that the Chong um, uh, you know represents the moment that the the egg and the sperm meet and and you create this this evolution of of yin and yang where where the yin and yang become one within the Chong and he talks about it as the sea of blood. Um, so it's a big influence on blood. It's a big influence on how we gather nutrition to make blood. Um, and it's also um, very much the genetic blueprint. So he, he will use it to try to work with genetic issues, to work with, for example, turning, um, um, turning off genetic expression that, that perhaps is, is counterproductive for the patient. So um, his feeling is that you could treat it three, three days on, three days off um, for six months. He would augment with essential oils um, on the days that um, the patient can't come into the office on that schedule. Um, but he, he does believe that you can shift genetic expression. Um, then when you move into the, into the Renmai, it's the sea of yin and the the um, the Dumai is the sea of yang, so he's seeing that as the 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 differentiation of the of yin and yang um, within within the embryo. Um, um, the the sea of yin, he, he, the Renmai. He talks a lot about banking the yin, so he really sees um, in a lot of people when you speak about mother issues. One of the things that he talks about is. Is, is in essence the rupturing of the yin. It's sort of like, uh, from an emotional standpoint, a cracked cup. If you keep pouring into the cup, all you do is make a mess on the floor. You know, you really want to stop pouring until you can mend the cup. So these are people who, for whom, no matter how much love and affection you, you give to them, um, you know, they're a bottomless pit because because you know the yin my uh, the ren my rather has ruptured, so he talks a lot about banking and solidifying the yin. However, also as you said, um, if the ren my is blocked, um, you can have dampness, and and particularly that that's an important issue um, um, for fertility. He says one of the key things of fertility is that the the um, the ren must be open and the chong must be nourished. Um, so you want to keep that Renmai open. And yes, absolutely, in terms of how you treat it, it's the opening point and then, and then key points along the channel. He talks about the dew as being the sea of yang. So it's your resources. It's the, I'm sorry, the, yin is, the Ren is the resources and the yang is the expression of the resources. So you can think of it as a, a construction site that the Chang is the architect's blueprint the Ren are the raw materials and the Yang are the workers that are going to come and assemble, um, that are going to come and assemble the, 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 the structure that you're building. And he speaks particularly fetally of, of um, you know, when a child uh, is very small and they're learning, they're learning to crawl, he talks particularly about the activation of do 14. And that's the point when the child starts to lift their head and then, also very important, the activation of do four, which is when they can start to crawl and move around a little bit. Um, and you don't want to rush that expression. You talked about how um, sometimes, sometimes uh, with the do my that, you know, it's not cycles of seven and eight, it could be cycles of 10, but he also sees that in the modern world that we may be talking about cycles of five or six or even four because that first cycle ends so quickly because of kids being exposed to so much with digital communications and all this sort of thing that they never had before. So, so he actually thinks that at the younger ages that, that the cycles are, are highly accelerated and that is, that's actually a negative for the Dumai because, because people, people are so overstimulated and there's a lot of the issues with, with a lot of you know, uh, brain 
uh, developmental problems that we're having right now with, you know, Asperger's and ADHD and that sort of thing is, is, a, is an overstimulation of the Dumai at a young age. So, so he's very careful also in terms of not working with young kids with, um, you know, too much with the eight extraordinary vessels because it's easy to overstimulate. Um, then when we move on to the Chow Mai, he makes a, he makes a distinction between, uh, yin chow mai and yang chow mai that that you know the, the chow are the heels so it's how you take a stand in the world and and the yin chow is really how you take a stand within yourself so so it's the oh it's easy to quit smoking i do it every week kind of person you know like i can never lose weight i never you know stick with my exercise program people who are unable to stick with things and also people who just generally have a poor sense of self-care. Um, they're not loving themselves in the proper way and caring for themselves in the proper way. They're not making themselves a priority. Yang Chao Mai is also how you take a stand in the world. So if the Yang Chao is weak, then, then you can't speak up for yourself and you never assert yourself. Whereas if the Yang Chao is overexpressed, you want to constantly change everyone in your life and change the world and dominate everyone and your way is the only way and and that sort of thing. And you can observe it by how the patient lays on the table. You can often see that that for example the the feet will turn in a little bit and because the the young uh, the yin chow is tight and and the yang chow is weak, you know, and so you have to keep the yin and yang chow balanced. Um, and of course, that's that's an important thing structurally that Kiko talks about too in terms of the heel. Um, but but for Jeffrey, of course, it's a, it's more of an emotional expression. Mm -hmm. And then and then with the way my he talks a lot about about it, it's the linking. So so we use Yin Wei Mai um, for um, for life transitions. Um, so people who are transition and say menopause would be a really important or menopause or andropause would be an important life transition or maybe uh you know someone going off to college who's very frightened about it or um, um so any kind of important transitions in life either physically or mentally and then and then yang wei mai um is really about linking up the energy for that. And you can really feel that when you use the dynamic pulses, um, you can feel that the yang is not moving between the organs. And so the person doesn't have the dynamic energy to move themselves into the next step. Um, so you wanna work with that. And then the dai is like the, is like the attic of the body. It's because it's the only channel that goes across, everything else goes from the limbs to the body or the body to the limbs, but the, the daimai is like the crosstown freeway. And so the dai takes on everything that we can't handle, everything that, that, oh, like right now I have to go to work, so I can't deal with my emotional life. Um, or it's just too overwhelming, so I can't deal with it. So we stuff it in the dai mai. We stuff it in the dai mai, and and you know the dai is sort of the way of flushing out the eight extra channels and and um, dealing with it. It's it's considered the most superficial of the the eight extras. And the order in which Avi and I are discussing them, actually, that's the order from deepest to most superficial of the eight x, as well as the the order in which they evolve in the fetus. So the, the dye is, is, is how you then can move it out more into the primary channels and also to get it out, um, just out of the body. So, so when the, when the, the, the dye is, is too tight and overstuffed, you can um, tend to have a, a lot of people with very tight back problems, you know, piriformis syndrome and that sort of thing. And when the dye is too loose and lax, you know, that you can have a lot of um, um, where, the, where the tendons are too weak and people, you know, they go for a chiropractic adjustment and by the time they're in the parking lot, you know, they're already out again. Um, so, so that's a way that the physical, can, I mean, the, the spiritual can be affecting the physical is with the whole structure of the lower pelvis. Um, the dye is also where we take a lot of post-traumatic stress syndrome because if you look at every, um, if you look at every, um, every creature on the planet, if they are attacked, 
their reflex is to curl up and protect their internal organs. So, so we subtly contract the psoas and, and curl up. But if you're under this low level stress constantly that you don't even notice, you're slowly contracting that dimite, contracting that inguinal region. And, um, and that's, a, that's an important uh, area for post-traumatic stress syndrome is to treat the, the dimite. Um, that's what comes to the top of my head, Avi. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, Mel, does that give you, um, because, the problem is between Camille and I, we can probably talk five more hours on this. <laughs> so, my Yeah, question, absolutely. You, <laughs> you, is there something else you would like? No, that, that's very helpful. It's, um, it's a, an area that's recently come to front of mind uh, for me personally. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm, so I'm just starting to learn about it. So it's really enjoyable to listen to you discuss it, just to get, you know, you're, you're both saying things that are similar to what I've read, but just hearing people with their different voice and their different takes is, um, gives one a bit more of a, uh, a, handle, a handle on it. Um, I would add, but well, so obviously the eight extra channels are, is something that there are many different views and many different ways of working. And like I, I said, I, I to use it totally different, you know, like depending, I might use it totally differently. Like the Kauai style is very different than this discussion, you know, that is, we might call Jeffrey style. Um, one of the things I would say that are worth looking at, um, well, there were two things when, when Camille started this, this image of building a building, I would just add, so yeah, so you have your Chang as your, the blueprint, the architectural blueprint, and the Ren as the resources and the Du as the construction. And then what I would add is that, so in the Yin and Yang Chao, what you have is this, um, you know, how do I use this room? This is going to be the kitchen, <laughs> or this is going to be the bedroom. We Different rooms, the house is built differently according to how I'm using it. So it's the usage. And then every X amount of time, um, you know, whether it's 10 years or four years, you know, if, if, if you build a house in a rush, you have to redo it after four years instead of after 10 years. But, you know, most houses, most of us tend to redesign or redo our houses. You know, the, um, whatever that's called, reconstruct or, you know. Re yeah. So those will be like the yin and yang way. And um, um, the dye would be the garbage can. Kind of every house needs a little bit of um, sewage or garbage, you know, to get rid of the. So the, I, mean, I don't know if that's helpful, but sometimes that's. That's really, that's really helpful. Yeah, no, that's really helpful. And it's, it's, it's put together, um, as I say, you know, personal. I, I had a, sort of like an, an eight extras sort of. Uh, uh, issue when I moved from the UK to the US that I hadn't been able to resolve using all of my various tools um, until I started understanding the system. And then also looking at patients, um, Camille mentioned, um, you know, using the Chiang Mai to um, alter epigenetic expression. And I, I feel like maybe I'm on the right track here. So studying functional medicine and using genetics uh, in my practice and epigenetics in my practice, the big buzzword a lot uh, nowadays is methylation, um, so, which is just referring to adding methyl group to uh, a molecule, but, and it's used for a lot of different processes in the body. It's used for altering genetic expression, it's used for creating new DNA, it's used for detoxification, it's used for neurotransmitter balance and hormone balance. And it was one of those concepts that I thought this is very interesting and very helpful and I'm not aware of um, an analogous system or process in, in, in Chinese medicine. It may just be a cross because I was really only dealing with the 12 regular channels. And then when I came across this, I thought that really is speaking to the Chiang Mai also with its relationship both to blood and to the bones. Um, because that's clearly, you know, an overlap there. One of the first things that I look at with methylation issues is if, if someone has macrocytic anemia, um, so the red blood cells are too big, that's a, that's a clear-cut methylation issue, and it's related to a lot of these neurodevelopmental issues. And so I'm not someone who tries to oversimplify and stuff Western concepts into Chinese ones. I don't think that that's helpful, but I do enjoy seeing where there's overlap and we're speaking about similar systems and processes. And I do clearly see that methylation belongs to the Chiang Mai system. It's, part, it's a Chiang Mai 
process and, and when Jeffrey's um, perhaps trying to alter that expression, he, you know, it, it may be more helpful to think about Chiang Mai, the methylation, but we can also see it in the blood chemistry. So that, that seems like that makes, makes sense. Thank you. And, and remember that what he's also talking about is, I mean, yes, absolutely, methylation is very important for blood and, and is a specific application, but he's speaking generally about being able to shift that person's expression. So it could be any SNP that's relevant. Right. I mean, liver SNPs, obviously the, 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 you know, the, like the SIPs, those would be particularly relevant. So, so I can see where you're saying about, about, um, about some being more specifically relevant to blood or Chong than others, but also don't keep your thinking so narrow because Jeffrey would say any, any genetic expression would no, be affected by the Chong. Yeah, I wasn't talking about SNPs. So that, that's, um, that, that's a, commonly where the focus is. So, um, <laughs> so me methylation, so yeah, the most commonly studied SNP has to do with methylation. Uh, and, we, and so that's where everyone's like, oh, do I have MTHFR? But, but um, people have lots of reasons why they don't methylate well, including- No, I understand. I do genetic yeah, so analysis I was, myself. Right, so, so what I'm talking about here is, is more of a, something that maps very well to the chunk not specifically just looking at the methylation pathway SNPs and do you have this or have that um, because you know people stop methyl methylating well because you know they do drugs or because they don't eat vegetables or, and, and that sort of thing but it really seems to me it is we're, we're speaking and also the thing about methylation SNPs that it's a meta problem because if you are not methylating well then your ability to express genes appropriately globally becomes and that's what I'm getting at that that's, Jeffrey yeah. would say Jeffrey would say it's about it's it's about how you express it and and your ability to pull back that expression which which the expression of it could be affected by whatever by things that have happened postnatally and that you can reverse some of that expression right and that's and, all I'm coming back to yeah and that's, that's, that's all largely and, we, and we may be having a semantic discussion and I don't want to okay. get too far off on that but it was just a small point I wanted to make okay yeah can I just interject for a second um so two things um that might be worth um considering one is um that that Shung also includes, um, you know, uh, I believe it's stomach 37 and 30, uh, 38 or whatever is the, um, um, the, the lower his C point. 39. Okay. <laughs> 39. Thank you. Um, so there, there, you know, so that includes that because that's um, in Ling Shu 33, that's the C of Chong. Okay. So that's another thing that you might want to look into. Um, when, when you're looking at, um, at the issue of um, genetic predispositions or, or, or breaking down uh, genetic patterns that I, I don't know because I don't have the experience for that, but just to, as an idea, if you want to take the chum, uh, I personally, now, um, okay, so I personally would look at um, things that have to do with the genetic expression um, you know, with um, the points that have the character Huang in them, okay, like Gao Wangshu, bladder 43, um, kidney 16, Huangshu, uh, Bao Wang, uh, it's uh, bladder 53 or 54, I'm not sure, but it's on the sacroiliac ligaments, and then outside the Sun Jiao Shu, you have a Wang Men. The character Huang is built of Wang, which means missing or dead or buried, Okay. And the un, that character below it, the um, thing underneath is in the body. So something that's dead or missing or buried that is still in the body. So you have to ask, how come you have um, two Huang Shus, um, Gao Wang Shu and Wang Shu, kidney 16 and then you'll be for 43. Something that trans is transporting, that's shifting in your body, okay, and yet it's dead. 
And the answer on that would be, well, most of your ancestors are dead. I mean, your mama and maybe grandparents are not dead, but you know, most of the real contributing <laughs> genetic code for you is already missing. <laughs> Uh, and yet it's active in your body. Um, so those are things that you can consider also. Um, and, if, and then you have bao huang, which means the uterus. And of course, kidney 16 itself is, um, relates to how you connect it to in the uterus. So it's your direct connection with the ancestors. Um, and I will say, I can't speak about the biochemistry because that's you know, functional medicine is not my field in any way, shape, or form at all. Um, but when someone comes and they have a symptom and part of the medical history is I have a genetic disorder, you know, I inherited this or there are many people in my family have something along those lines. Usually I will start looking at the Huang points either as a reflex, do they have pain there and should I resolve it or as a treatment point. And, uh, you know, the well, there are many big differences between me and Jeffrey. <laughs> it would not be a good comparison. Um, but I am, it's interesting because when I first started uh, learning from Jeffrey, Jeffrey was very careful about saying, well, and he still is, um, and yet he's changed, and partially because he, I think he doesn't practice so much. He certainly doesn't practice acupuncture per se, as he would say. Um, so, you know, he does other modalities possibly. I'm not sure what he's doing, you know, in terms of seeing patients now, but I have a much more practical way of dealing with it. And Jeffrey was very clear about, you know, be very careful about shifting people. And, you know, if you talk, especially to Tibetan Buddhists, they talk about doctors are like the, the, the scum of the earth. <laughs> you know, they're the worst karma you can have because they're, they're constantly trying to shift people. And people can mm. only be doing their own, you know. So there's something to to have some reverence for. Um, so sometimes, you know, Jeffrey's, you know, I'm looking at, you know, kind of like, okay, if they have, let's say, specific symptoms, can I change those? I'm a little less uh, interested in the acupuncture sense with shifting people in things that are, are there's, you know, they are psycho spiritual because they're, yeah, acupuncture can help, but it's almost like going the back door to it. You, you it's almost like you're saying, "Don't work on this issue. Let me needle that point, and you know, you should now, some somehow miraculously get better." You know, they should. Yeah, they should. Well, maybe they could meditate or do their thing with it. Um. So I'm I'm I would suggest that possibly using something like stomach thirty seven and thirty nine. You said right, Camille. Um, which are the Sea of Chong in the leg might be a useful way without getting too um, caught up in, in creating these shifts, uh, as well as one points might be something. And which brings me to another thing. When you do eight extraordinary vessel treatments and you actually, quote unquote, as Jeffrey calls it, painting the channel, um, I find that it's very important to work with a with a patient when they're on the table and explain to them. So for example, the yin chow is, is, a, is the clearest in a way. Um, so it starts with kidney six, uh, jiao hai. Um, jiao means to illuminate or to shed light. Hai is the ocean, to shed light on the ocean of life. Okay. Um, so do you want them to, to kind of get the idea, okay, we, we're doing this, so, so give them the opportunity to create their own image with, with that, as opposed to just the needle is there. And the next point is uh, kidney eight, which is jia xin, um, which is to, to the intersection of trust. Okay, so if I shed light on my life, I want to have some trust on my life. Mm. And although we're not needling, the channel does go through the inner thighs into the genitals, through the diaphragm, the heart, uh, which most channels do anyway. Well, not all, but mo the leg channels certainly would, uh, meaning the big obstacles we have in life, you know, in our uh, sexuality, or we can call that the, um, the material world, and being able to open our hearts. So I like to say, you know, we post 60s think we're very open sexually, but it doesn't mean that we're open in our hearts. Um, so being able to um, go through these gates in life. Um, and then your next point is going to be uh, stomach nine. So once I've done that, I've shed light on my life. Um, 
trusting the process and being willing to go through the obstacles of life, doesn't mean I'm successful, but willing at least, then I can welcome myself, welcome human is the name of the point, um, uh, Ren Yin, uh, stomach nine. So then I can have wisdom or bright vision, uh, Jing Ming, bladder one. Um, so, you know, which can be used either to, to express uh, um, insight or wisdom, or it can be literally um, bright vision. Um, so, and then I can live in the world well because I can ex express myself to the world through my eyes and, and receive the world well through my eyes. So I think sometimes, you know, having, you know, working with the points, uh, with the point names to give the, the, their client their own imagery with it, it can be very useful. Um, and let them make it their own. Um, but, you know, the, then it becomes, okay, I came to you because I have these, you know, weird blood cells and, you know, now you're trying to, you know, screw up with my whole life and, you know, by blah, blah, blah. And, you know, soon you're going to want me to quit my job and go to Peru, <laughs> you know. So that isn't always, uh, it's not every patient's resonance. Now, it may be every patient's resonance for you if you build that clientele because that, that's your residence. So if you have, a, you know, if the client, that's not their thing, there may be, that's why we need more tools sometimes, if that makes sense. That was quite beautiful. Thank you. Could you, could you talk more about how you use the long points? Like you mentioned that, that they could be treatment points as well. What reflex would you, would you bring them back to? Okay. So, if they are painful, I would try and release them and I would try. So this is the problem for, with studying with me nowadays is that I don't, I'm not big into do this for this so much. So if they're painful, go back to the medical history. So first of all, so let's say bladder 43, UB 43, Gao Wang Shu is painful. Um, so um, maybe UB 53 would resolve it. Okay. The problem with UB53 is it tends to be tender and gummy, especially with people with autoimmune disorders. Okay, that's mm. Wait, which one? Sorry? Which point? Bladder 40, 53. Okay. Baohuang. Okay, so the sacroiliac ligaments in general tend to be ropey, um, ping pong ish in people with autoimmune disorders often. And those are, again, can be genetic expressions. So the trick of using bladder 53 for UB53 is not always such a great trick. So then I'm also looking at what else is in the medical history. Also, UB43, which is on the inner border of the scapula, is especially on the left, is part of the autonomic nervous system. Don't forget this point is outside what we call the pericardium shoe, but there is no pericardium shoe. The, ne the name of the point is Jui Yin shoe. Okay, it's not um, Xin Bao shoe. Okay, mm -hmm. or Xin Ju Shu. It is Jui Yin Shu. So it relates to the Jui Yin. It does not relate necessarily to the pericardium. Mm -hmm. I don't know what that means exactly, you know, but that's it, just to respect that. And so, but bladder 43, outside of that, it's definitely an area that has to do with circulation. People with constricted circulation, they're going to, you know, be tight on the inner border of the scapula. And especially on the left side, it's going to relate to the autonomic nervous system because you have a pacemaker. Okay, and a pacemaker is an autonomic nervous system function. So do too often, at least on the left, but often on the right too, will release um, bladder 43. Go you on. left and right? Sorry? Do too? Do I what? You said uh, do too on the left and the right? No, no. If... Okay, do two is on the center. Okay, all right. You took out the okay, got it. Treats left UB43. Okay. You'll be amazed. I would say 90% of patients have some sort of pressure pain on left UB43. However, do two also can treat right side UB43. Not always, because that uh, on the right side UB43 can relate to the liver and fat metabolism also. Don't forget it has the character gao, which is fat. Okay, so then you need to look at liver, but do to can release them. Now, if I'm, I'm choosing to needle them, say they have 
I don't know. Um, well, I don't have enough experience with this blood disorder to, to suggest, you know, but let's say they have some abdominal finding or neck finding that they have something that I'm going to test it against because I give them like the functional medicine people. I like to test things. <laughs> okay. I don't like to just do them. So I, you know, my lab is the patient. So let's say they have stomach night pain, just, just for the sake of it. Okay, you can say, oh, that's supposed to be thyroid or whatever. But let's say now we're saying it's genetic. So when I'm pressing bladder 43, it doesn't have pain on it. And I'm pressing it towards the scapula. And I'm saying, ah, oh, did it release stomach pain? And if the answer is yes, I'm going, ah, oh, it's a genetic problem. It comes from your mother's side, all these thyroid issues. So I can treat your thyroid with kidney. And I will. Because for me, the thyroid is in the kidney domain not in the spleen or, or heart or stomach domain, which TCM says. For me, it's in the kidney domain because the kidney channel circulates the throat and it's a metabolic gland. It's a gland. So in my opinion, it's Jing. But I would also add UB43 um, and preferably with moxa, direct moxa, but doesn't have to be. Um, so, uh, and then, so, and then I can also use, for example, kidney 16 and see if kidney 16 will release UB43, etc. Um, or if it released other, other things in the body. So I'm, I'm, it's not like this point will release this. It's if this idea is correct, it will release lots of things in the body. Does that make sense? Yes. All right. So uh, I think we lost Mel. I think it's <laughs> our hour. But I'll, we can spend a few more minutes just summing up <laughs> if anyone wants to speak or whatever. Is there anyone even else on the line? Uh, yeah, Mary Jo is oh. on the line. And oh, okay. Oh, oh. Is on the line. Um, okay. But it was exactly 11, I think, um, Mel might oh. have to leave. Okay. So, um, well, let's meet again next week if people are, are wanting to or do and enjoy whatever <laughs> the day, <laughs> wherever you are in the world, wherever, whatever time it is. <laughs> Thank you so much, Avi. This is really helpful. And I wanted to tell you your ocean treatment from last week was a big, oh. was a success. Oh, excellent. So I think we're on the right track. So thank you very much for that. Too. Thank you. So thank you. Bye. Bye. All right. Bye-bye.